Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we are going to present our final results of multi-hazard vulnerability and risk assessment of historical city center of Tamar. We'll start with project objective and introduction of Tamar and then move to uh, survey methodology and mostly concentrate on the obtained results. As already mentioned, uh, the aim of the project is uh, to carry out large-scale multi-hazard uh, vulnerability assessment for historical city center of Tamar using simplified approaches to access flood and seismic vulnerability and risk. The methodology is considered as a first level approach and based on vulnerability indexes. Um, the municipality of Tamar uh, is located in the geographical center of Portugal um, in the district of Santarém. Uh, the city center of Tamar is a medium uh, sized city situated on uh, the banks of River Nabao. Uh, the city center has an area approximately 100,000 uh, meters square and consists of 520 buildings. However, only 500 buildings were analyzed in this study. In order to conduct uh, the survey, the study area was divided into five specific zones using the primary streets uh, in the city center. Uh, the history of flood events in Tamar for the last uh, 20 years is shown on this slide. Due uh, to its close proximity to the river, the city center is prone uh, to flooding. On the next slide, uh, you can see some photos of historical flood events in Tamar made by local people in different years. Moving on to seismic. Uh, uh, historically, Portugal had uh, some major earthquakes in its history, most of which have affected the region, of, um, the region around Lisbon. Uh, but um, there have also been a few recordings of earthquakes uh, felt in the region of Santarém, where Tamar is located. On the figure on the left side, it can be seen that uh, there has only been one earthquake relatively close to Tamar since the 20th century, but uh, it didn't make any uh, damage. Uh, however, Tamar in a high um, peak ground acceleration zone, in a high intensity zone, as can be seen from the maps of Portugal in the middle and right side of the um, slide. Despite this fact, Tamar has not had any major earthquakes in its history and no major damage has ever been recorded in the city site. Uh, moving uh, on to methodology. Uh, the QGIS uh, software was used to enter the parameters into the system, which would be used to store the information collected during the survey. Then using the Mergent plugin, uh, which acts as a database coordinator, it was possible to access uh, the maps and parameter fields on smartphones uh, using the input application uh, for assessment on site. The input application was used to streamline the survey process, which was necessary due to time restrictions on site. Once information was collected, it was synchronized with the cloud to ensure uh, that everything was safely stored in QGIS. And now, my colleague Lucy will talk about flood assessment in detail. Thank you, Tatiana. Now we can jump into the flood vulnerability analysis. We discussed this topic in depth in the last two presentations, so we'll be going quickly through this to summarize the work that we did. To summarize the steps we took, first we were able to assess the individual vulnerability of each building with respect to an in-person survey completed in November and an analysis of the flood hazard that exists in Tomar. Then we combined the physical vulnerability with the flood hazard for the 20-year and 100-year floods in the risk analysis. And finally, using this, we attempted to mitigate the impact of the flood damages using different mitigation techniques. So, to begin, we will show an introduction to the vulnerability analysis of each of the over 500 buildings in Tomar. Each building was assessed for 10 different parameters relating to the sensitivity and exposure that could be combined to create the flood vulnerability index, also known as the FBI. The sensitivity and exposure parameters relate to the ability of water to enter into the building and what this would impact. Each building has its own FBI depending on the parameters from the survey. On this slide, we show the histogram and the distribution of the FBI. Here we can see that the distribution is skewed to the left with a low mean value, showing that the buildings themselves have a lower vulnerability. Next, we can see that the level of FBI, broken into categories from low to extreme, depending on the mean and the standard deviation, as distributed across the city center on this map. This map summarizes both the vulnerability analysis and the hazard analysis, because you can see the depth and the extent of the flooding that can, can, that can be expected from a flood with a 20 year return period. From this point, we can calculate the flood risk to each building. We were able to calculate the flood risk of each building by taking into account the FBI and the amount of flood exposure using this flood risk matrix. The vulnerability hazard matrix shown here was created using the distributions of FBI and hazard from the negligible or low to extreme. 
Using this matrix, the final flood risk for both the 20 year and the 100 year return periods were, were found and are shown in the next slide. The flood risk can be seen here with the flood risk ranging from negligible and extreme depending on the matrix from the previous slide. So here's the map from the 20 year flood. Then we can see the map from the 100 year flood which is very similar to the map from the 20 year flood. As we can see, many of the buildings with higher extreme risk are located closest to the river and along the main commercial streets. Another interesting analysis we could do was to adapt the depth versus damage curves that were created for Barcelona to Tomar in order to address the economic damage that comes from floods. The maximum damage cost can occur in education and hotel buildings and would cost around 110 euros per meter squared at a depth of two meters, which is the highest depth of the hazard in Tomar. As you can see in this chart, the cost levels out around 1.5 meters where the maximum damage occurs no matter the increase in flood depth. So using these curves for Tomar, for example, if all of the restaurants in Tamar faced extreme flooding damage, this could cost around 600,000 euros. In order to offset the economic damages within Tamar, flood mitigation strategies could be applied. Two analyses were run in order to address this. We applied the research we completed to determine the best mitigation techniques that would be applied to each parameter in our vulnerability analysis. In this case, five dry proofing techniques in the respective parameters were chosen to be updated. Dry proofing techniques were preferred to wet proofing, as with wet proofing techniques, the interior of the building is allowed to contain water, which was deemed not good for this case study. Two separate risk mitigation analyses were run where we updated only the most at-risk buildings in each parameter, which were considered class D. And in the second analysis, we updated the high-risk buildings for each parameter, so classes D and C. In this way, we were able to consider both a smaller and larger scale of citywide mitigation. Here we can see the impact of the second analysis on the FBI. The second analysis is shown because the effects from the first analysis are quite minimal. Additionally, here we can see the impact that each parameter has on the FBI when the mitigation analysis is complete. First, we analyze the impact of the parameters and their mitigation techniques separately, and then we analyze them together. On this slide, we can see that S5 and E2, which are the door and window openings and the concavity and permeability parameters, they change the most. Additionally, it shows that the vulnerability for each of the parameters does decrease with the mitigation techniques introduced. And the next slides will focus on the impact of these two parameters. So first we can see exactly how parameter S5, which is the openings to the ground floor, impacts the flood risk. Only the 20 year flood is presented here because the 100 year flood shows similar data. As you can see from the graph, analysis one has a small impact, but with analysis two, a large difference can be seen in the extreme high and negligible flood risk levels, proving that it does make a difference. If we use flood doors or flood skirts at a as a mitigation measure, it can severely decrease the number of high-risk buildings. So a similar result can be seen with E2 concavity and permeability, showing that by increasing the water drainage capacity of each building in the city center itself, the risk of the buildings can be decreased. So finally, we can see the impact of these parameters together in the analysis. This means that by combining the efforts of updating all five parameters, we can see the respective flood mitigation strategies cumulatively. When all these are used together in both analysis one and analysis two, the flood risk decreases. And with analysis two, it's able to mitigate the extreme and high levels of flood risk, basically down to zero. This can be shown further in the map on the following slide. Here we can see the impact of the analysis. As seen earlier, analysis one didn't show a significant improvement. So for clarity, we're only gonna present analysis two. The map shows the impact of all the mitigation measures used together, as I just said. So to reiterate, the two techniques that provided the largest impact were using the floodgates and decrease the number of openings, which would improve parameter S5. And secondly, improving the drainage systems of the buildings in the city center, which would impact greatly parameter E2, which is concavity and permeability. As you can see in this map, applying these mitigation measures makes a significant impact and greatly reduces the extreme and high-risk buildings. Next, Tatiana can introduce the research on the cost of these measures. Uh, the cost estimation of mitigation measures uh, is an important factor, uh, but information is not um, often available or hidden in non peer uh, reviewed literature. This is an issue in many countries, including Portugal. For this reason, the cost estimation was uh, completed based on uh, available information. So those prices are shown for the UK. Uh, the price of flood resistant measures depend on size and type of property, depth and duration of flooding, and they're usually calculated during the design. Uh, after the performance of analysis, uh, the following conclusion can be made. Uh, most of the buildings at risk are located on commercial streets perpendicular to the river and also buildings close to the river. 
the overall flood vulnerability was found uh, to be low for the building in Tomar. Uh, this is due to the generic approach we took um, for the assessment, but also can be re related uh, to the condition of buildings, which uh, was generally good. Uh, also, the risk between 20 and 100 years uh, flooding events uh, were, uh, was very similar. This is because the hazard level for 20 and 100 years events was also very similar. And with I uh, for both uh, these events uh, stay the same. Finally, we found that if uh, some of uh, the mitigation strategies are used, uh, then the flood risk can be reduced depending on which mitigation strategy is applied and how um, the parameters are affected. Uh, the cost of mitigation measures is not always known um, and can be high, but uh, thereby reduces the further cost of repair works. And now Damiana will introduce the seismic assessment. Thanks, Tatiana. So moving on to our seismic hazard analysis. Our seismic vulnerability assessment had four main parts. First, we conducted a physical vulnerability assessment using the facade approach. Next, we defined different damage scenarios and conducted a risk assessment. Finally, we looked at the evacuation paths and how this could be taken in the event of a seismic event. So the first thing was to acquire the data for the seismic survey parameters. So we have four main categories of seismic parameters. We have the facade geometry and openings category, which includes the geometry of the facade, the maximum slenderness, the area of the openings, the misalignment of the openings, and the interaction between continuous facades. The measuring materials and conservation category includes the quality of the materials, the state of conservation, and the replacement or the lack thereof of the original flooring system. The connection efficiency to other structural elements category includes the connection to orthogonal walls, the connection to horizontal walls, and the impulsive nature of the roofing system. Finally, the elements connected to the facade and the improving elements are part of the last category. As we mentioned before, due to pandemic restrictions, some of the parametric data had to be acquired by other means. So some of the data was collected by us by looking at pictures provided to us by the city of Tomar. So this approach is mainly for the facade geometry and openings categories and the elements connected to the facade. Additionally, the state of conservation was taken from the flood parameter when we conducted our site visit previously. For a couple of the parameters, we used last year's data as their seismic approach had some overlap with what we needed. However, even with all of this data, there are still some gaps that needed to be filled. For this reason, we implemented an upper bound and lower bound approach. In other words, the lower bound was considered the best case scenario and the upper bound was considered the worst case scenario. So we use this approach to account for two different types of lacks of data. So the first being missing parametric data for specific buildings and the second being missing data for all or most of the buildings within a single parameter. So for the first gap, we tried to reduce the uncertainties by using the average data of the known buildings. For example, if the average class of all the known buildings in a certain parameter was class B, the lower bound would be class A and the upper bound would be class C. So this prevents us from using class A for the lower bound and class D for the upper bound, which gives us a much higher uncertainty. We also conducted a sensitivity analysis to see the difference between using the average class as the lower bound and the same upper bound as we just stated. So we learned from this analysis that the mean values and standard deviation were very similar. Therefore, we opted for our first approach. So the problem was that we had three parameters with insufficient information. So for this, these three parameters, we had to use class A as the lower bound and class D as the upper bound for all the buildings. This approach definitely leads to a larger discrepancy between the lower bound and upper bound results so more uncertainties, but it's also a much more conservative approach by choosing these bounds. So once we had all our parametric data, we were able to calculate the seismic vulnerability index for all buildings. It was also possible to calculate the mean damage grade for each building for a given European macro seismic intensity level. So this map shows the seismic vulnerability distribution across the city. Based on the overall color of the lower bound and upper bound maps, we can see that the distribution of the seismic vulnerability index is quite different between the two. In fact, the lower bound has a mean IVF of 32.9 and the upper bound has a mean IVF of 56. So in this histogram, we have a better representation of the distribution of IVF values for all the buildings surveyed. In the lower bound, approximately 50% of the buildings had an IVF between 30 and 40, and in the upper bound, almost 70% of the buildings had an IVF between 50 and 60. 
So using the average seismic vulnerability, it was also possible to calculate the mean damage grades to create vulnerability curves. These curves represent the expected mean damage for a range of macroseismic uh, intensities. So here, each discrete point represents a mean damage grade calculated using the mean IVF and the macroseismic intensity level in Roman numerals, which we see on the x-axis, for both bounds, so the upper and lower bound. For example, on a macroseismic intensity of level 8, we would expect a mean damage grade of around 3 for the lower bound and around 3.8 for the upper bound. So the shaded area on this curve represents the mean damage grades using the mean seismic vulnerability index plus or minus two times the standard deviation. So this allows us to see that there is in fact some st statistical overlap between the lower bound and the upper bound data. However, because this overlap is relatively small, we can see that the overlap between the data is also minimal. So for our seismic analysis, we also have different damage grades that we need to consider, which can be seen in the table on the slide. So our first damage grade of D0 refers to no damage whatsoever in the building. D1 refers to the presence of localized or hairline cracking in the building. D2 relates to some damage around the door and window openings with some localized detachment of the wall coverings or the plaster. D3 is for horizontal, sorry, diagonal cracks and a visible separation of the diaphragm. It also includes a general plaster detachment. D4 is for extensive cracking and partial collapse of the facade. And finally, D5 is for a complete in-plane or out-of-plane failure of the facade wall. So here we can see a map of the mean damage grades of the individual buildings in the city center. Based on this, we can see that between the lower bound and the upper bound maps, there's an increase of almost a whole damage grade. So in fact, the lower bound map mostly has buildings with a damage grade of D3, while the upper bound has almost all of its buildings with a damage grade of D4. So after the damage grades were obtained, the next step in the analysis was to create fragility curves for the damage grades. So fragility curves are used to represent the probability of a given damage grade being exceeded. Here you can see the fragility curve for the lower bound of the different seismic intensities. So for an example on how to interpret the curves, looking at a seismic intensity of 8, there is approximately a 30% chance that the damage will be in class D4. Um, there is approximately a 50% chance that the damage will be in class D3, and there is a 20% chance that the damage will be in class D2. Comparatively, on this slide, you can see the fragility curves for the upper bound of different seismic intensities. So from the fragility curves, it's possible to obtain the damage probabilities for each intensity level. So on this slide, you can see that these damage probabilities show the probability of any one building being in that particular damage class. Looking closely at intensity level 8, we can see that the probability of a building being in damage class D3 is 50.7% for the lower bound of this intensity level. And the probability of each building being in damage class D4 is 61.8% for the upper bound. So when we compare the damage probabilities from the previous slide with the actual damage distribution for the city, there is a distinct correlation. The damage grade that had the highest probability of being given to a building after a seismic event is indeed the damage grade that majority of the buildings will receive according to the damage distribution. So this means that for intensity level 8, most of the buildings are in damage class D3 for the lower bound and in damage class D4 for the upper bound, as the probability graph suggests suggested. So to help cities make citywide decisions on emergency planning, um, analyzing damage scenarios are crucial. So using the damage distribution from the previous slide, it is possible to map which buildings will experience partial or full collapse of the facade. If the damage class is D4 or above, we expect that the building will experience at least collapse of elements connected to the facade. So part of assessing damage scenarios is determining the evacuation routes from the city in case of an earthquake event. To evaluate these evacuation routes for Tomar, the lower bound of intensity level 8 was used. This intensity was chosen because the city should not expect significant collapse or even partial collapse until a seismic event of the lower bound of this intensity level is reached. For the upper bound of intensity level 8, it was found that 99.5% of the buildings would at least be partially collapsed. So this means that evacuation would not be possible in this scenario. 
So considering these aspects, the lower bound of intensity level eight was deemed to be the most appropriate for our analysis. After determining which building would experience collapse, the evacuation routes were mapped. So if the road was accessible, meaning that the road is wider than four meters and no obstructions exist, um, it was marked in green. If the road was restricted, meaning that the road is too narrow for emergency vehicles to access, but no obstructions exist, it was marked in yellow. And lastly, if the road was inaccessible, meaning that the road is too narrow and obstructions do exist, it was marked in red. So inside the historic city center, all roads except for one had a width of less than four meters, which automatically made them restricted. Um, but the one road that was wider than four meters had potential obstructions at both ends of the road, making it only accessible through the restricted access paths from inside the city center. Um, so since most of the city center would have restricted access, many of the residents may be able to walk to safety after an earthquake. But unfortunately, if residents need assistance of emergency or rescue vehicles, it, they may, may not be able to get the help that they need. So using the evacuation pass from the previous slide, it is possible to determine um, areas within the city which may be isolated and inaccessible after an earthquake event. Although most of the city center would have at least restricted access after an earthquake, eight distinct areas were determined which could possibly be isolated. In total, there's a possibility of 82 buildings being isolated after an earthquake event, which is 15.8% of the total building stock in the city center of Tomar. After determining the probability of inaccessibility for the isolated areas for different intensity levels, the number of isolated people can be determined per area. So for the, from this graph, it can be seen that for an intensity level of seven, the probability of having isolated people in the, air, in the areas is very low. In fact, there's a probability of one person being isolated overall. But for an intensity level of eight, the probability of isolated people increases exponentially to a possibility of 39 people being isolated overall because the same type of increase it can be seen in the probability of inaccessibility. For an intensity level nine, there is a probability of 84 people being is isolated overall with everyone in area six and seven being isolated. And for all intensity levels above that, there's a probability of everyone in the specific areas being isolated. So in total, there's the possibility of 92 residents being isolated after an earthquake, which is 10.1% of the total residents in Tomar according to the census. So to reduce the number of isolated areas and people, retrofit strategies can be applied to the buildings. Two types of analysis were run to assess the impacts of retrofitting strategies on the evacuation routes. The strategies were introduced by updating the class of parameters included in each analysis. So it should be noted that only traditional strengthening strategies were used in this analysis. Both analysis consider wall consolidation, but the first analysis takes into account an anchoring system, while the second one uses tie rods. Wall consolidation is when transversal ties are used through the masonry and repairing existing cracks in the assembly is done. So analysis one corresponds to improving three parameters, while analysis two corresponds to improving three parameters from analysis one and two others. So on the next slide, you can see from the two maps that the application of retrofitting strategies improves the damage level of the city as a whole. The inaccessible roads for evacuation routes are mostly reduced with analysis one and are completely non-existent if we consider analysis two. So now Tatiana will talk about the costs of these retrofitting strategies. Thank you. The cost estimation was performed for both analyses mentioned before. It was done uh, by summarizing prices for each measure. Uh, the price of analysis of uh, two is almost three times um, higher uh, than for analysis one due to the price of usage uh, the tie roads. Despite the fact that the installation of them can be more effective and increases the number of evacuation roads according to perform analysis, it's not always economically profitable and also because analysis one has enough roads to evacuate. Following conclusions can be made after performing uh, the seismic analysis. Buildings with a high vulnerability index are distributed throughout the city center. The mean value of low bond seismic vulnerability index is found to be low 
while the mean value for upper bound of uh, seismic vulnerability index in, is in a mid range. Uh, most of the city center has restricted access for recreation roads. Overall, uh, there are 15.8% uh, uh, of buildings and 10.1% uh, of people would be isolated after the earthquake. Um, the application of retrograde strategies uh, has improved uh, the level of access in most areas from inaccessible to restricted and accessible. And now we are moving to general conclusions. Thanks so much. It really was an interesting project and seeing the impact of these natural hazards on the historic city center was eye-opening. Now I can present some general conclusions for the project. First, the vulnerability analyses we ran can have a large impact on the city as a whole. Specifically, we were able to know which buildings are more important to update first, which means in the case of the flood hazard, it's necessary to update the buildings by the commercial streets. So, with respect to the cost of the mitigation, these costs can be reported to the local city government for a more in-depth cost estimate and should be compared to the cost of damage that these hazards can create to understand exactly what these implications can be. Furthermore, to expand this type of analysis to other city centers, we notice that there's an ability to do the lower bound, upper bound analysis virtually with different data sources. This is due to the amount of information available already and the use of the lower bound, upper bound allows us to kind of analyze and account for data that is missing. Additionally, cloud-based surveying is an easy way and a fast way to complete surveys for large amounts of buildings, such as what we did for the flood. There were some technical difficulties that we faced when using the input app in Mergen, but it was still undeniably easier than carrying around binders for each building. The cloud-based surveying made interacting with mapping and data analysis much easier and definitely has a lot further to go. Another thing we noticed is that some of the buildings that have both high flood risk and a high probability of collapse. So, so there are 10 buildings in total that face a high risk from each, which means that these buildings have a high or extreme flood risk. And then also they have a probability of collapse. And so those are the buildings in red that you can see in this map. So that's just kind of a fun combination of both of the analyses that we ran. Overall, it was a wonderful project and we learned a lot. We'd like to close by saying thank you to our supervisor, Dr. Ferreira, and to everyone who helped us throughout the last few months and everyone who came to watch this presentation. And now we'd love to open the floor for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. We have now five minutes for comments or questions. There are Hello. no questions. Mm -hmm. It looks Everybody like... Everybody is afraid. I also make a question. <laughs> <laughs> and so did you meet the municipality? Did you share the results with them? I mean, it's very important to uh, work at this level to be transferred to the authorities who have the means to act on your findings. Um, no, so we didn't actually meet with the municipalities. Um, so the data that we did get from the municipality came from a previous survey that was conducted. However, uh, I think future discussions would be sending that through our supervisor and possibly giving them that data that way. Mm -hmm. We'd love to share our knowledge with the municipality. We haven't gotten a chance to do it yet. Mm. Yes, could be very, very helpful for them. I think uh, Professor Oliveira has his hand up. Yes, I just uh, raised my hand. Well, congratulations <laughs> for the work done. I, I love it. It's really, it's really amazing what you can do after a few months and get this uh, critical information. I agree totally with Professor Lawrence that it means you have to share this. This cannot stay with you only. You have to share this with, with, the, with the guys in trust, the people that are in the field managing the, the city. This is really, really important. I was just wondering, well, you, when you show the, for instance, for the seismic uh, retrofitting, uh, does it, because this should, this cost some money and uh, well, money, money is not really that much available and time as well. Does it make sense to do a kind of um, sequential uh, planning say, okay, there are some critical roads, as you mentioned, that should be available. We'll start with these ones, maybe in the next five years, 
or I don't know. And then later we can go for secondary roads or so. Uh, do you think this will be will make more feasible your your proposal? Yes. So uh, in this analysis, we did only consider the retrofit of approximately 37 buildings. Um, however, because we don't fully understand the city of Tamar and which roads are the important ones, we don't have a sequential analysis. But definitely it's very possible uh, if we had that data, if we knew which roads were the most important to uh, use as evacuation routes, it's very simple to see which buildings we would need to retrofit because we also have the areas per floor of each of these buildings as well. So we'd be able to get a more accurate cost and probably a lower cost based on which buildings we're assessing. Because using the evacuation routes, we can do further analysis and we're able to find how much time it takes for the people to um, get to safety um, using the roads. So if we did all that type of analysis, it is quite possible to find out which areas are more at risk than the others. It's also interesting too, to see from the city side exactly what sizes and maybe you change kind of the uh, the scope in the restricted access like width because uh, there must be some sort of ambulances and other emergency vehicles that are already able to go through the city center so based on data that the city can give us further it would be interesting to see have like a step-by-step -step approach okay thank you congratulations thank you thank you Okay, more questions? Okay. Uh, if I may, if there's no more questions, yes, uh, mm -hmm. I just want to, to drop a word of praise for, for the group, okay, for the excellent work. Um, and this was carried out in very difficult circumstances, as we know. So everything went really smooth and it was a great pleasure to me to guide you um, on this journey. And uh, just regarding the municipality, just state that the channel is open and we'll be for sure very, very happy to, to share our findings with, with them. So congratulations guys again, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much um, for the presentation and also for the work. Um, now we are uh, moving for the second presentation. Uh, the second presentation uh, will uh, be focused on the work carried out on Casa das Convertidas in Braga. Go ahead, please. Okay, I have a video. Good morning. We're going to present the case study of Casa das Convertidas. The contents of this presentation are divided in eight sections that include the methodology, the historical survey, the field survey, entity inspections and dynamic testing, structural modeling, new use proposal, intervention phases, and the maintenance plan. The methodology follow includes the historical survey, the inspection, and we want to note here that they were limited to the condition of the building. Therefore, it's recommend more on depth future inspections. After this, we proceed to the monitoring and the structural modeling. Regarding to the historical survey, um, the Casa das Convertidas is located in Braga, in the north of Portugal. It's located in the corner of Avenida Central and Rua San Gonzalo, near the city center. The original use was a Casa de Recolimento, whose aim was restoring the purity in the so-called sinful woman that arrived at the place. In 2012, the building was classified as a monument of public interest. However, nowadays it's abandoned, but the group Amigos das Convertidas carry out some activities or maintenance with the aim of rescuing the heritage that the building represents. The history of Convertidas dates back to 1720 with the purchase of house located next to the chapel of São Gonzalo by the Archbishop of Braga, Rodrigo de Moura. The building was formally established and inaugurated in 1722 under the motivation to help women in a vulnerable, vulnerable situation. However, the lifestyle were more often seen as brutal and prison-like. 
Regarding to the building, the, the records mention a reconstruction of the tower on the 1820s. It remained under the authority of the Roman Catholic Church until 1911, when the, after it was controlled by the states. Until 1998, the building housed women. The last year, some public has interested and some intervention has taken place. Now we continue with the visual inspection. Regarding to the architectural survey, the building is made up of three stories distributed around a courtyard. The access from the main street is through the south facade. Typically, the contact with the exterior was prohibited, so this explains the configuration of this area. In the ground level, a vestibule connects with the chapel, this area, the central courtyard, and the stairs that lead to the first floor. To access the chapel, the passage is through the low chorus. On the ground floor at courtyard level in the west and east wing, there are storage rooms and the space uses prison. The storage room and the prison. On the first floor, we have we found 17 rooms distributed in U shape. In the north wing, the living, laundry, and bathroom are located. The second floor, similar to the first floor, uh, houses 23 bedrooms distributed with the same configuration. The tower was originally used as a workspace. In the north wing of this level is located a renovated kitchen as well as some bathrooms. The southern facade presents the most stylistically work, an ornamentation area that consists of carved stone. The east facade presents some openings in the area of the higher chart, tower, and corridors of the south wing. The rest of the facade is blind. Only two small windows in the second floor can be observed. The ventilation and lighting are given by the central courtyard. Now we continue with the construction system. Um, the access to the roof was limited. Uh, however, the information collects shown that have several trusses configuration conferred by timber rafter, timber joists, and purlins covered by ceramic tiles, as we can see in the photos. For the second level, the perimeter facade walls are made of granite rubble masonry. Meanwhile, the tower have timber partition. The cell rooms in the level are made in Latin plaster. The kitchen and bathrooms have some block walls. Regarding to the floor system, it presents a timber frame composed by joists. In some areas are single. Meanwhile, in other can be recorded double and timber planks on the top. The first floor is also made on timber frame, conformed by single joists and timber planks. The masonry walls follow the configuration previously explained. However, the cell rooms are timber framed with masonry and fill. In the living room, we've, we found some lightweights and block walls. In the ground floor, the walls are made in masonry and the floor, depending on the space, it can be found like stone plinths, compact soil, or timber rains floor. The damage detection method was the visual inspection on the site. Once this was complete, the office work was carried out in order to create the corresponding mapping. The five main categories of damage that the building presents are biological colonization, discoloration and deposits, material loss, detachment, and superficial loss. Throughout the structure, there are several locations where severe creeks can be found. These vertical cracks either form from concentrated loads, typically below the beams, creep loading as well as at the corners where the concentrated stresses are critical. In this slide, we can see an elevation where the cracks can be depicted again in a different perspective. You can visualize the trend in which the cracks form below the beams due to prolonged stress exposure. This view also shows how the vertical cracks connect through the different level of CASA. 
With respect to the timber damage, the water ingress has caused severe deterioration and loss of material to the timber elements. This limit our access to several parts of the casa, including most of the cell rooms. This will be an important aspect covered when it comes time for the intervention phases. Um, uh, several non-destructive uh, tests also uh, were carried out in the building to obtain information about the quality of the material give, given the long-term decay and, and lack of maintenance uh, throughout the building. So in particular, uh, um, uh, the piloting test was done locally in a timber beam at uh, top floor ceiling to investigate uh, the extent of decay and the resistance of the, of the cross section. The GPR um, uh, validated uh, uh, our assumptions uh, of the morphology of the masonry wall being a two leaf uh, wall system and the construction type uh, of uh, also reinforced concrete slabs at the balcony and the kitchen area of the building. Uh, the moisture index uh, analysis confirmed the severity, uh, the, hum the severity of the humidity levels, which were uh, quite um, uh, high, both uh, in, on surface and in depth of the masonry stone walls, justifying the, condition, uh, the conditions of the decay. Last but not least, uh, sonic tests were performed in uh, several locations uh, throughout the building, providing useful information about the morphology, quality of the walls uh, with voids uh, or discontinuities. Uh, in particular, um, uh, as you can see uh, on these uh, plans, uh, from the indirect sonic tests, we were able to obtain uh, the dynamic Young's modulus, which was uh, uh, then used to make initial assumptions and correlations with uh, uh, the calibration process of the numerical model. Now, uh, the dynamic uh, identification test. Uh, this type of test is the only NDT technique uh, to measure uh, experimentally the dynamic uh, model parameters uh, associated with the structural behavior, such as vibration mode, shapes, and natural frequencies, damage states, and connectivity between floors or walls in certain areas. So as you can appreciate, this uh, becomes a valuable tool calibrating numerical models that can capture a realistic representation of the real uh, building behavior. The type of the dynamic test uh, was based on uh, ambient vibration measurements uh, and the excitation was random in time and was based on environmental traffic vibrations. Uh, as you can see, um, the acquired data was processed using uh, those uh, two um, uh, model identification methods. Um, first, the, the enhanced uh, frequency domain decomposition and also the uh, the stochastic sub-base identification method. So using the EFDD uh, methods, uh, an estimation of the modes basically is carried out by picking up the most clear peaks in all the setups, as you can see on the left um, uh, diagram. And in the SSI uh, identification, the estimation was manual in order to get the maximum number of uh, stable uh, modes per uh, setup. Now, um, as you can see on these uh, uh, plans here, uh, a simplified model of the structure, uh, as you can see uh, actually on the 3D schematic view on the right hand side, was implemented um, uh, in the Artemis software in order to replicate the three setups um, as shown on the tower and second floor and first floor plan uh, with uh, the locations of the accelerometers. For each uh, uh, test setup, uh, the ambient vibration test data was collected over 20 to 30 minutes intervals. Now, uh, what we have identified, uh, as you can see uh, within the summary table, uh, and we have the four modes. Uh, uh, we selected those four modes. Um, and the first mode, uh, as well as all the rest, are really local modes in X or Y direction. And uh, uh, specifically, the first and third modes were used later on, as you can, as you will see, for the calibration of the numerical model. 
Um, Cross validation of the results was conducted through the calculation of the model assurance criteria between the modes identified above. The correlation of model vectors varies from 0 to 1, and modes with a MAC higher than 0.6 can be considered as reliable, which we actually have, particularly for the first, third, and fourth. <coughs> and, uh, um, which is equal to one, and it, it's a good match uh, for the uh, mode shapes. Um, now, for the calibration process, the calibration procedure was done throughout a series of updating analysis uh, of changing the parameter of Young's static modulus obtained from literature and uh, sonic test result, and adjusting accordingly also uh, the CR modulus. Finally, um, uh, as you can see on this um, uh, correlation here of mode shapes between experimental and uh, macro element results, you can see how close uh, we managed to get um, uh, the calibration and uh, um, particularly between modes, uh, uh, the, the first two modes, as you can see. So ba based on this, then we carried out the, uh, the numerical analysis using the 3D macro software. Right. After the calibration, the model was prepared to run the nonlinear analysis. Please notice that the entire building was modeled, and regarding the horizontal element, only the floor in better condition were accounted. The model was modeled following a discrete macro element approach in order to guarantee at the same time geometrical consistency and less computational effort. The Masary panel is discretized into square whose corners are connected by diagonal springs. The macro elements interact with each other through discrete interfaces with limited tensile resistance. The figures show an example and know the Masary panel is divided in case of opening and the mesh definition on our study case, following the division in pier and spandrel. In comparison with the finite element modeling, we had less refined mesh and therefore less accurate results, but the lower computational cost allowed us to model the entire building during the short time provided. The type of failure considered are in plane one, also enabling us to save again computational cost. This would not have been possible without programming the introduction of strengthening intervention as shown to assume the best behavior of the structure. In particular, here is proposed introduction of steel ties embedded into the floor in order to connect the parallel wall of the two long wings of the building to compensate the absence of orthogonal walls. Moreover, the connection between the floor and the walls are meant to be improved and the flexible floor are stiffened as shown. A third check was done for vertical loads by considering the ultimate limit state according to the Italian norm that is already implemented in the software and the results were compared to the damage mapping to identify any kind of correlation and understand the cause of the damage. Some differences were found due to the fact that some of the cracks are, as we can see, due to concentrated loads or, as in this case, due to the alteration of the structure over time. The non-linear static analysis pushover mass control were performed by loading the structure in negative and positive x and y direction by applying it self-weight with a lot step of 0.1. The capacity curve showed the base shear normalized with respect to the weight versus the displacement. In particular, the software provided the capacity curve for a different control point, and here the one with the highest value of displacement were reported. It were to be mentioned that after the occurrence of several damages, the redistribution of the load is done, and from the first control, the analysis runs based on the displacement control. In the X direction, the analysis stopped where the rocking failure of a macro element in the 119 was attained. Here you can see how the, lo the local in plane failure of the wall progresses with application of the weight. First tensile crack, shear failure, reaching of the rocky and limiting. Due to the big opening, this will result the one with lasting plane resistance. Here we can appreciate 
The evolution of the damage propagation in the Corton West facade, again parallel to the direction considered, and we can see how the shear crack propagates and the presence of shear crack due to the layout of the opening. Similarly, was done for the west facade, in which we notice first shear crack, then tensile one. Here, we can see a similar scenario in the direction negative x, where we appreciate the same kind of failure occurring after reaching the rocking limit, and a similar evolution of shear crack and tensile crack in the wall of Cortian and west facade. And that wide direction, in this case, the last expected event is the shear failure of one of the macro elements of the main facade. More into detail in this scenario, so first shear crack, something side crack in the reaching of the shear failure. And the north facade, the different disposition of the opening provides a scenario that involves the tensile crack and then some um, shear crack start opening. Sim sim finally, similar scenario is found in the negative y direction. So, at the end of all the analysis, complementary to all the step of the methodology proposed, we were asking, is the structure safe? Well, first of all, further analysis should be done in order to assess in more detail some part of the building, probably in the portion where the chapel is located. That seems to be the most vulnerable one. Moreover, some, vertical, some uh, damages are created by vertical load and <clears throat> And uh, by considering that the seismic hazard of the north of Portugal is relatively low, we can say that uh, if assuming a box behavior, thanks to the intervention uh, uh, proposed, avoiding the first mode mechanism, which would occur before the second one, uh, we can see the in-plane capacity of the structure is uh, uh, higher than uh, the PGA of the zone. Now focusing on the new use proposal. From our months that we were able to spend at the CASA, we quickly became aware of the efforts put forth by the Amigos das Convertidas organization. Before this pandemic, their group not only focused on cleaning up and maintaining the house, but they hosted events there such as small concerts and gatherings for kids. In coming up with a new purpose for the CASA, we envisioned it to transform into a community center for the city of Braga. This would be a place for members to socialize and learn new skills at any age. The team thought up a new design layout for the center in which I will just point out a few highlights. One aspect that we really wanted to incorporate was the improvement of accessibility. We think it is best to place an elevator near the staircase for open access to all three levels. We also want to incorporate a removable ramp for those who need it to enter into the center. And in the lobby room, we thought it would be very welcoming to have a directory describing the role of the center, which would be written in Braille to further this idea of welcoming all. The CASA could have workshop areas, a library, and a projection room, for example. Another important feature that we wanted to incorporate is the gallery on the first floor. This will not only serve as an active display area for artworks created by the community center members, but it will continue to depict the background of the casa and the stories of the women who lived there previously. We have felt that this would be a beautiful and simple way to keep the casa's character and pass along its history. And finally, considering that the casa is located right in the heart of the city, across from the park, and amidst other museums and libraries, this center would offer a unique experience in a safe environment. However, to imp implement this new use, several interventions need to take place. After analyzing the main issues, the team composed five phases to repair the current damage and provide methods to prevent this damage from ever occurring again. The first phase is repairing the roof, considering that the main issues had to do with leaks, drastic humidity and temperature ranges, as well as excessive biological growth. Currently, the roof system does not have any waterproofing uh, which just invites water ingress. The roofing assembly should be repaired so that there is not only this membrane, but also proper ventilation and insulation as well. Also, ensuring a proper gutter and drainage system can help reduce potential for clogging and water pooling. This eliminates leaks and potential for plant growth. 
The next phase focuses on the exterior masonry facade system. Plaster detachment, staining, and plant growth are serious issues overtaking the walls. Our suggestion is to conduct a full cleaning to prepare the surface for proper repointing and potential grout injections. We also recommend that for the new render application, the base of the wall be coated with not only a compatible material, but also consist of hydrophobic qualities to resist that rising damp. Meanwhile, the remainder of the facade can receive render that shares similar mechanical properties to the mortar. As part of this phase, the windows need repair as well. Waterproofing around the frame is recommended, along with repairs to the broken panes and muntins. And removal of the metal panels is necessary to allow the entrance of natural light and help with moisture controls. With the water ingress solution solved within the first two phases, the next step is the timber element repair. Because of the high moisture environment, a large portion of the timber within is suffering from missing material, deformation, and degradation. The methodology for repair will depend on the severity of damage for each element. Beams and planks that are worth saving can receive a prosthesis repair, while those that are more damaged will suit better for full replacement. The typology and orientation should be maintained. Additionally, metal plates and corbels can be used to strengthen the beams, especially those that are deforming. It is important to assure proper contact with the masonry wall, avoiding transfer of water and ultimate decay. After performing the structural modeling, the team realized that the potential for out-of-plane movement in the east and west wings. Even though we are not in a high seismic zone, we felt it was valuable to install tie rods from the exterior facade through to the interior courtyard facade to resist this behavior. Now, for the chapel, this requires more detailed work, considering the painting of the arch timber ceiling. We recommend specialized repair of the missing materials and the installation of dehumidifiers to maintain proper moisture levels. It also might be of use to design a system along the extra dose of the arch in which the chapel arch can be suspended from, but this will require further inspection. The next phase focuses on the interior walls of the casa. Similarly to the exterior, there is plaster detachment and plant growth. Therefore, the masonry wall surface must be cleaned and repointed. Afterwards, we suggest applying insulating panels to help with the temperature controls and then plaster application that's suitable for the already present materials. For the partition walls, we currently have a lath and plaster system. We want to preserve this system. Therefore, to adjust for the new layout, the partition walls that are not needed can be removed while the remaining ones are repaired using the same plaster material for the interior masonry. And finally, for our last phase, the interior courtyards need to be suitable and safe for guests to come and enjoy meals and socializing. This entails removing excessive plant growth on patio and balcony areas to avoid hazards, as well as introducing railings among stairs and the different perimeter levels. We also recommend bringing in tables and chairs to make the environment more welcoming. And this here is just a depiction of each of the five phases and where they will be Im implemented in the CASA. Now, with all this work performed, it is important that it does not go to waste. That is why the team came up with a generic plan to keep systems healthy and up to date. Aspects like the roof and gutters should be checked after each season to avoid leaks and any inefficiencies in the system. However, the exterior and interior facades, as well as the window systems, do not have to be checked as often. Major issues will be noticed and repaired with the CASA being in active use. Maintaining of the courtyard will occur more frequently and can even be taken care of by the gardening group that is suggested to be held in the community center. And to finish, aspects such as plumbing, electricity, and appliances should be serviced every few years or so to ensure efficiency and proper production. With that being said, we have a few people that we would like to thank your support and guidance throughout this process has made this a wonderful and knowledgeable experience. We are extremely grateful for your expertise and patience throughout the, these past months. And finally, we want to thank all of you for your time and attention, and we hope that you have enjoyed learning about the CASA. And of course, please let us know if you have any questions or comments. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation in time. Um, 
we have also uh, five minutes for comments and questions. Hi, I have a question. Maybe I can I can start. So first of all, a congratulations for for the work. So my question is is about the model. So as you said, you had to assume a box behavior in order to to run the model. So as you know, this means that in your in your model, the floors are uh, probably much stiffer than they are in reality, and also the connections between the floors and the walls that. Uh, in your model are probably more efficient than, than they are. And this is clear, for example, when you when you look for the, the pictures that you have shown. So given this, my question is, how much confidence can you have in your results? Can you just um, elaborate a bit on that? We have confidence because uh, we are assuming that we are going to make an intervention which will provide this box behavior to the building. Since the uh, floors are in very bad condition and we need to do mm -hmm. intervention, especially in the floors, we are assuming that we are doing this intervention. So this is clear. With this yeah. intervention, we are providing the box behavior of the structure. Thus, we can rely on, on our results of the structural modeling. Yeah, okay, I, I, I got that. But this means that the results that, that you shown are actually for a building that doesn't exist, right? Yeah, we are considering uh, the, um, we are considering the already strengthened building. Also because of the time that we have, so it's uh, a way of validating our uh, intervention if you want, because we have very low, very few time to do that. So we need no, to- I know, oh, I know, and I and a great job. I'm just asking this, but, uh, but congratulations again for the, for the work and for um, having this, this very interesting model. That's all, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the Paulo Lorenzo. Okay, so um, actually, I also had a question. I mean, I, I I assume that you use mass proportional loading, no? Yes. And do you think that uh, a model proportional would be adequate? Sorry. You think that if you distribute the mass according to the modes, would be adequate? Oh, uh, okay, yes. Well, we prefer to do, in this case, we prefer to do for the mass. And uh, uh, I think it was better in our case because of, uh, because, um, because of the complexity of the structure. Mm -hmm. I think so we, we prefer to, for this reason to avoid uh, the other kind of distribution. Mm -hmm. would be no, I fully safe. agree it would be totally wrong to use mode proportional because the modes are local. So if you use mode proportional, your results are nonsense. Yeah. My understanding. But okay. Uh, I had a, a question regarding 18. I think the slide 18. Um, I could not understand very well the crack. I'm assuming it's a crack at floor level. I mean, this appears in other ones, but this crack, I mean, which is um, transversal to the building and quite long, mm -hmm. um, is, is at the floor level, I suppose, in the patio or not. This crack, what is this? What is this red line? S4? In the plan. No, no, in the plan. Uh, is this? Yeah, that one. So, sorry, uh, that that uh, that crack. Um, it's a horizontal um, uh, crack uh, between the um, on the ceiling, basically uh, standing at the balcony and looking on the ceiling of that wall. It's a horizontal crack. Uh, um, it's a fine crack. Yeah along this line. We don't uh, showing this, it's external crack. Um, 
it's just on the interface of the of the of the wall and the ceiling at this point. And then it, the it, it it does not continue to the external walls on the top or in the bottom. Uh, it, uh, no, we haven't seen any continuation. It was uh, just along that interface, and we suspected okay. it was something that they did with the ceiling and, and the existing wall uh, um, as a probably separation. Uh, but okay. yeah, we haven't seen that continuing further. So it is possibly because they made an addition, a small addition as a cover or a roof or uh, a walkthrough. And then this, uh, yeah. there was some settlement. So it's not a structural issue uh, regarding the entire building, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, that's what we, um, that's how it uh, looked, I think, also to you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Daniel Oliveira. Hello, again. I have no questions, just to give you, to, to congratulate you for the work, for the hard work. And uh, I particularly appreciated the final part where you organize this into stages or into phases, showing also to the owner that it is possible to be done and what is the, what is the priority. So I think this is really important. If you say everything is priority, then nothing is priority and nothing will be done. So the way you organize work is really nice. So the owner can really understand that it is possible to make this real and you show him the path to do it. So I really like the the way you did it. Congratulations. Thank you. More comments or the questions? Okay, if not, uh, personally, I would like to, um, to um, uh, thanks all the work done uh, for the group. It was great to, to work uh, with you and thank you very much also for the work done. And um, I would like also to um, acknowledge uh, the, um, the cooperation of from uh, Dona Julia and Fernando Mendes that uh, all of also follow us uh, all, all, in all our visits. And I would like also to uh, acknowledge the, the cooperation of Professor Luis Fontes that uh, was uh, uh, in the beginning, in the, um, uh, it was his idea, uh, uh, the use of this building, and uh, I acknowledge this. Uh, I acknowledge uh, Javier Ortega for the cooperation during the non-destructive testing. Um, and uh, finally, I would like to uh, uh, publicly um, uh, acknowledge uh, the, um, the allowance to use the building from the Ministry of Internal Administration. Okay, so I'd like to, to thank you all for this opportunity to work with you. Okay, thank you. And uh, nice now, uh, okay, okay. yes, for, for sure. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I have a, a little breakdown on the computer, but uh, I heard uh, all, the, all the presentation and I would like to say, uh, first of all, congratulations for the, for the work. Uh, I think uh, for, for us uh, archaeologists, it's uh, extraordinary how you uh, can do uh, so much in, in a little time. <laughs> yes. uh, I think uh, Above all, uh, it's important to uh, transfer this, this kind of studies to the authorities uh, because, uh, uh, as the colleagues uh, have said, uh, we can do something uh, about the, the building and uh, uh, you can uh, fix the priorities and uh, it's important uh, begin to do uh, for the first priority, which is the conservation of the building and uh, after thinking about the, the future use, uh, the possible use uh, uh, for the building. Thank you for, for your efforts and your work. Okay, thank you very much. Now uh, we move for the third group, please.
Good day, everyone. The for delay, uh, let me introduce our case study for the great Hindu ministry. Monastery Hindu is located in the Kerala Hindu and Manish Manish District in Bagar District, about 5 kilometers away from the Manish. The highest rainfall can be found in the month of December, uh, the highest and lowest in all the country is great, 42 and negative 6. Typically, the average rate of the is 80 percent, and the location of the monastery is by patient And this monastery is a beautiful place in public schools and monument. The place is still so from the monastery. Next, I will move on to the histories, past constructions, and expansion. Throughout centuries, various expansions, modifications, and events are still the fate of monastery of what we can see today. Uh, the monastery is believed to be built shortly before 1090, and the church was completed by 1151. The south wing was built in 1662, including the refectory in south wing. Meanwhile, the church was again built in 1719. Phase four marks the major expansion of the west of the church, which includes the west wing. In 1834, the monks were expelled and most of their properties were sold to private owners. The West Wing was used as home occupation to private owners for various productions. There was a wine fire in 1877 that destroyed almost half of the monastery. Hindu monastery was classified as a property of public interest in 1943. However, the walls and the roof of the church collapsed in 1960. And rebuilt in 1965 with concrete barrel walls. In 2012, the government bought the monastery and the major intervention works on the church and chapels was completed in 2020. The West Wing, the timber roof class, was built around 10 years ago. So now my teammate Amir will discuss further on the geometry and some observations on the Hindu monastery. Okay, thank you, Sun. Hello, everyone. So our presentation will be introduced using Beno 2 vr This allows us to walk around and throw the building and describe our work. So for the damages that we found for the monastery, the building in general had problems in moisture represented by biological colonization spots around the buildings. Also the growth of vegetation affect the building the most. However, I'll be talking about the severe structural damages only that we inspected for the monastery. So starting from the ground floor, as we can see at the plan on the west wing. So we noticed a complete demolished three walls at the end of the west wing, as we can see. Also a demolished floors that extended to nearly three walls that we believe they were made on purpose due to the reconstruction process of the underground walls for the basement, as we will see later. Also for the same west wing at the end, we noticed two structural cracks at the walls, at the both sides. And we also found a previous attempt to inspect the movement of these cracks. As you can see, this is shows the first crack on the left side. And the picture shows the plaster mask they, that they used in back to January 2019 to inspect the movement of the crack. Also, at the other side, you can see another crack that goes also from the ground and to continue until the first floor, as we can see, we will see later. So for the same ground uh, floor, if we are going to, uh, okay, this shows also the problem of moisture that we found at the corners. It's not something new as the rest of the building uh, have problem moisture. So going to the south wing for the refactory, as you can see in the plan, the south wing. Okay. okay, so for the refactory, we found two structural cracks. Uh, the first one is located at the end of the wall, this one, and the picture shows uh, that we used uh, a crack meter to inspect uh, the movement of this crack. 
And after uh, nearly four months, there is no movement at the crack emitted for this crack. The second crack that found in the refractory was at the top ceiling at the arches. As you can see from the picture, the crack goes along the roof and along the arches. Okay. So that was just a quick uh, summary for the damages for the ground. Now going just to talk about um, uh, more about the first floor. So if we are going to the first floor, you can see, okay, yes. So the first floor for the west wing. So you can see a completely demolished floor for the rest, for the first level. At the corridors, and also you can uh, see them uh, inside the rooms, which they were doors. Uh, so another thing to mention that we used uh, data loggers to inspect the humidity and temperature at this floor and also at the basement, as we will see later. And also uh, for the same corner for the west wing, we can see the continuity of the structural crack that found in the ground floor that's going up to the first floor. And the picture shows that we used also another crackometer to inspect the movement of this crack. And again, after four months, there was no movement. We believe the four months period is quite uh, short. And uh, anyway, we left the crack meters there, maybe for a future uh, uh, inspection for the cracks. Uh, however, uh, going just to the basement to see the, the damages that we have in the basement. Uh, if you are going to the basement for the west wing. Okay, as you can see, the vaults or the structural uh, uh, condition of the vaults are quite good. They are in good condition that they were reconstructed recently. However, the basement is suffering from uh, moisture problems. Uh, you can see the biological colonization all over the walls and even the floor. And since you enter the basement, you can sense the humidity and even smell it. However, we used also another data logger here, as we can see. Uh, and the picture shows the results for both the basement and the first floor. So the basement shows a higher rate of humidity and less temperature than the first floor, which is in the yellow uh, color at the top for the humidity, which makes sense because the basement uh, has problems in uh, uh, or lack of lighting and ventilation. And uh, the humidity and temperature of the first floor are almost the same as outside, as there is uh, openings all over uh, the building. There is no windows or doors. However, that was uh, just a summary for the damages that we have. Next, I will talk more about the 3D model that we uh, did for the West Wing. Uh, so going to talk to show more about the geometry. Okay, so the inspected of the structural cracks of the West Wing was a strong motivation to do further studies and test of the safety of the building, capacity of the walls, and the out of plane movements of the West facade. To do so, we created a 3D model and we tried to represent the real existing condition of the structure. So first, as you can see from the section, we have a different thicknesses for the, for the walls, starting from the basement and going to the ground and finally to the first floor that we tried to consider in our 3D model. Also, we, we, uh, we modeled the structural system, the arch and wall system that is used in the basement and the ground floor also, uh, we use the load for the uh, pitched roof at the top of the west wing. And also we try to model the same exact openings at the building. As you can see, uh, some of them are inclined like in the basement. So the second picture will show the model that we got for the west wing, just to have a clear uh, image for the different levels that we have. So at this, yes. So this is just showing the uh, different levels, the basement, the ground, and the first. And the roof was just indication for the load. <clears throat> so the last picture shows uh, more the structural system that we have, the arch and vault system. 
as you can see from the third picture. Yes, that shows the arches that we have are located between the, the walls and not at the walls. That they are supporting the columns and they connecting uh, the walls at the basement and the ground floor. So to have a clear uh, image for the uh, vault uh, system, uh, we will just provide uh, a 3D model or illustration for only the vault. So if we are going back to the first floor, we can see one of the collapsed vaults that will show you clearly the thickness of the vault. Yes. And the thickness also for the arches that we have in the monastery or the west wing. So uh, at this point, we also try to consider the different materials or filling materials that we have. As you can see, we try to also model the filling material and uh, the sand, sand layer and the second photo. And finally, you can see the final floor. This shows the sand after the filling material and finally the wooden floor. So that was for our 3D model. So let's talk a little bit about the photo scan. So as we said, the structural cracks were strong motivation to do further studies. One of these studies were the photo scan that we did the photo scan to, uh, to uh, yes. We did the photo scan for the west facade of the west wing to study the art flame movement of the facade. The first picture that you can see here, it shows the 363 photos that were, that were taken by the drone. And then the next pictures, you can see how we created the model or the mesh for this part of the monastery. Yes. That we use to study the art flame movement that would show you in the next two pictures. Now, as we have the mesh and the model, it's just only to study the west facade of the west wing. So the last picture that you will see now, okay. So uh, we study the art flame movement by using elevation levels or point. So to better understand this, you can look at the, uh, different colors, as you can see the gradient from orange to yellow, that shows the different uh, levels at this facade. And also you can see, uh, or you can look to the points, the elevation points that we have. And as you can see, there's a minor difference between the elevations, which they present a slight deformation or a slight out of plane movement at this facade. So that was for the West Wing. Uh, for the refactory, if I'm going back to the refactory again, that we did the same thing for the refactory as we inspected a structure crack here. Yes, so we did the same and we uh, generated the mesh or 3D model for the arch that we uh, see in the picture. And the second two pictures will show the model and will show uh, uh, the exact shape of the uh, arch. In the last picture, it shows you that we have a small uh, deformation that the vault uh, or the, sorry, the, the arch is going a little bit down in the middle where's the crack located. So that was for the photo scan. Uh, so now we are going to talk more about the analysis. So going back to soon. Uh, in Sony test, in order to have a better understanding of the modulus of elasticity and masonry, we have conducted several uh, some tests in West Wing and uh, factory walls. The following shows uh, the average results that we have summarized for column, wall, and wall. Um, for arch, since we do not have the E values for the arch, we have extrapolated uh, values of column and wall. Considering that the stiffness of column uh, should be higher, while the mason wall is lower than what we have adopted the E value of six for arch, uh, start uh, for our modeling purposes. Later, my teammate Salah we explain further on how we finally use calibrated values in our dynamic structure uh, analysis. Down with the task, let us move to the first analysis, which is uh, kinematic analysis. Uh, 
Yes, Amir has shown cracks, especially at the West Wall of the West Wing. We suspect that the West Wall may be subject to our plane for such a return. Therefore, we have conducted kinematic analysis on the wall facade as shown here. Uh, if we zoom by to calculate the capacity of, of uh, 0.996 field, both the ULS and ULS safety checks, and the wall is prone to outplane failure. Therefore, additional enforcement is required to run a uh, failure mechanism. Next, we will show you some input parameters for the analysis. Well, here we can see the loadings that were used for the kinematic analysis. The uh, typical area is 11.5 meter length and 2.11 meter width. By using the new code for this version, we have obtained the design ground acceleration of 1.35. Now, Salar will discuss further on dynamic identification that we have done on West Wing to find out more about the mode shapes and frequencies. So uh, yeah, thanks soon. I will continue uh, with the dynamic uh, identification tests. <clears throat> In the dynamic uh, identification test, I was with it uh, for two parts. First, for the west wing of the uh, monastery, we did uh, two types of setups to obtain the dynamic identifications, such as the mode shapes and the frequency, natural frequencies of the structure. Uh, also, we did uh, the uh, dynamic identification test for the specific uh, vault uh, in, the, uh, in the West Wing. Uh, so in the next slides, we will see the results that uh, we have obtained from this uh, identification test. Uh, so uh, we did uh, the with the type of EFDD method, uh, and uh, we obtained for the first mode uh, 2.05 hertz, and uh, with the most shape that you can see. And for the second mode, we obtained 2.99 hertz uh, for the second mode. Also for the volts, uh, for the first mode, uh, we obtained uh, 9.13 hertz. And uh, for the second mode, uh, we obtained 16.21 hertz <clears throat> for the uh, out of the results of the Artemis software. Uh, so the next uh, uh, phase to do is the Diana modeling and our model with the uh, results that we obtained from the Artemis. As you can see, uh, these are the, our two FEM models uh, that we uh, uh, did the analysis on both of them. Uh, the first is the West Wing of the Monastery, as Amir described very well uh, the, its uh, description, and also the uh, uh, just one vault that we wanted to do the push down analysis on it. Uh, I should mention that for the uh, hexatype mesh type, we just used the Eight nodes, uh, um, eight nodes mesh, and uh, for the triangle, or um, we use the five five points mesh elements. Uh, so here you can see the properties that we've used for the uh, different parts of the structure, as we had walls, arches, uh, columns, and the vaults. Uh, so. For each one, uh, we obtain uh, the values from the uh, literature and from the uh, sonic test that we've done for, for the modules of elasticity. Also, we did the calibration uh, that I will uh, talk about it in the next slide. Um, here you can see that uh, once we did the eigenvalue analysis with the uh, with our primary values. Uh, our differences uh, with the experimental value for the mode was, um, the difference was about 1.32 or 1.45. Just to calibrate uh, the uh, modules of elasticity. So we just uh, divided these values to the uh, power two of 1.32 uh, to calibrate model and uh, to be closer to the real, uh, which is the experimental uh, uh, results that we've got. Uh, so after that, after calibrating, uh, the results that we obtained uh, for the first analysis was 2.34 hertz. Uh, 
for the first one and for the second one was uh, 3.7 hertz uh, with the effective mass percentage of 39 and 10%. Um, also, uh, for the uh, volt, uh, we obtained 9.97 uh, hertz for the first mode and for the second mode, 16.28. Uh, so uh, you you may see that uh, the our difference is about fifteen to eighteen percent. Uh, we can say that uh, um, because of the and at first point because uh, of lack of time we could do uh, we could repeat our exercise and uh, do more. Uh, but uh, we have we had in uh, lack of time. Also, uh, we could do, do some uh, uh, more modifying in our models, such as uh, load distribution of the wall and something like that. And also uh, <clears throat> we can go to the site to get enough uh, in more information uh, for this issue to be more closer to the uh, natural one. Uh, and um, then we did the push uh, over analysis in the direction of the uh, positive X for the whole building and uh, the push down analysis for the uh, vault. Um, so as of the uh, lack of time, uh, let's say for example, for the push down analysis, uh, we wanted to check the uh, post-peak behavior, but um, with the low steps of 0 0.1, we didn't reach that. We also tried uh, others, but uh, till now, this is the uh, best type uh, that we had. Uh, in the continue, uh, uh, soon we'll uh, talk about the intervention that we were going to propose. The intervention proposal. Uh, the area of intervention is confined to the West Wing only, considering the external damages, urgency, and economic potentials. One of the first tasks that must be done is to create a heavy vegetation. As a timber of first floor west wing is decayed and may not be usable, we propose that the floor to be replaced with new timber floor. Three collapsed cross walls that are six, seven, and eight to be reconstructed. The table here uh, shows the ancient handmade wood dimensions from historical study in Portugal. Therefore, it may not be commercially available, but it is always encouraged to find a creative uh, process to the deployments possible. We also propose ground injection for the cracks found. Uh, especially near the west wall, in order to ensure a uh, homogeneous wall. Furthermore, roof drainage is provided uh, so that heavy downfall can be channeled properly away from the roof. The staircase at the north wall is suggested to be repaired. Meanwhile, the staircase at the south wall is suggested to be replaced in the staircase of a compatible materials. Next, we will take a look at the reinforcement for the west wall outside of the west wall. Um, anchors are suggested as a reinforcement to pull the rest of that. But, um, I don't think we have uh, 10 locations for the anchors as shown here. Each anchor will be going to the land and have a roof one that's one of the other things we need. After the other proposal, uh, we are now ready to change in the cost of the simulation. Cost of simulation shown here is mainly for the people according the be not effective for a reason. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams, Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, let, let us talk about future. We would like to propose that. Uh, Further comprehensive tests to be conducted in order to have better understanding of the characteristics and mission building. For example, a uh, more sonic test to be done to obtain higher accuracy of the value of the walls, wall columns, and arch. 
possible. Um, there are areas that we were unable, un unable to assess for the case study. But on the positive side, it also allows to students experience and enjoy the process of the study. These places include the first floor of the south wing and the structure surrounding the square as shown here. In addition, structural analysis can be conducted on the root trust in order to check uh, this capacity. Next, let us quickly see our monitoring system proposal. In order to understand the effects strengthening long term behavior structure, um, the monitoring system should be in place for at least one or two years upon completion of the uh, strengthening works. It is important to place a two meter with north wall, since it's a standalone wall as shown here. Uh, five meters is a case of certain effects or behaviors as well. So uh, for future usage of West Wing, uh, this allows us to send the uh, idea. Uh, this one, we'd like to propose the monastery to be converted to a boutique uh, hotel with exquisite restaurant, a garden with flowers and plants that sell in farm in Portugal can be one attraction. Although the uh, hotel occupancy rate may be seasonal, the restaurant is therefore able to provide year round cash flow with a lessee as part of a niche differentiation strategy. We believe that this is a fantastic idea and we sincerely hope that it is workable. Now, we have come to the end of the last. Uh, presentation for the case study. We hope that you enjoy and love new monastery as much as we do. Please do not hesitate to ask us if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the, the presentation. Uh, now, again, we have five minutes for the um, for questions and um, any comment, an additional comment. Uh, I can ask, uh, I can make a question uh, about the cost uh, estimation. Uh, what was the basis for the, for the, for, for this um, estimation, let's say? Uh, you mean the unit waste or the, uh, the, the uh, quantity of materials? Uh, yeah, the quantities and also how you um, make the estimation of the costs. Okay, firstly, we refer the union rates to the Spons uh, uh, price book 2020. And uh, uh, we, we, we have uh, calculations. For, for example, the new timber roof calculated the uh, amount of the uh, area because the union rates were are based on the meter square. So, uh, yeah, this is how we come up with the cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, for the um, for the use of the building, for the future use of the building, uh, mm -hmm. have you um, had any any input of the owner of the building, or you did not um, discuss this with anybody? Uh, because of the current uh, COVID situation, it is very difficult for us to meet the owner at the moment. So. We did not discuss with the owner yet on this proposal, yeah. mm -hmm. but, but we believe that on, on the philosophy that uh, to be able to generate uh, revenue is, uh, is also good because it's, it's also formed part of the thesis to, uh, for the uh, conservation and intervention process of uh, historical buildings. Thank you very much, Paulo Lorenzo. Hey, so thank you. Um, I had a, well, I had a couple of questions, one regarding the sonic testing. Yes. And so if I understood well, in one case you use indirect testing, and in the other case you use direct testing. Is this correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And so do you think the results are directly comparable? Uh, for the column, actually, we have a wide gap of... Uh, 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 key values. Uh, so we, we were only using indirect test results for the column. Yeah. Because the direct test was uh, much more lower, so about three to, three to four uh, gigapascal. I didn't understand. For the column, you only use direct tests or use direct and indirect? Uh, for the column, we were using the indirect test results. 
And for the wall? Uh, for the wall, we average it. As we can see from the picture over here, um, for the wall, they are only indirect tests. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, um, you have to be careful because indirect normally gives you a vertical value. Direct gives you uh, an horizontal value. And in this case, it's a lot controlled by the stone. Huh? if you use direct for the columns. So it's not a fair comparison in my view. Um, you would probably, obviously that the stones are different and, and the measure itself is different, but you have to be, be careful if you compare different things. And I was also a little bit confused about the vaults. <laughs> so in, in the beginning, I think I showed the vaults with multiple levels and infill. Mm -hmm. which from the photos, it seems like there is no infill. I mean, or if there is an infill, the infill is non-structural. And then in the pictures, it seemed like it was structural, but then in the model, you did not consider it, which in my view seems to replicate better the reality. Yes. So, I mean, are the infill there or not? Is it structural or not? Okay. Well, the diagrams were just indication for the different uh, layers or just to describe the load above the board that we have. But actually when we use it for Diana, we only, uh, we didn't model the infill material, but we calculated the load for it and we add it at the top of the board. So the three diagrams, small diagrams that describes the three materials just to describe a little bit the different layers or load that we have above the model. But it's not the exact model that we in, uh, imported to Diana to do the test the push down or to do, uh, to do the in value analysis, yeah. Also, also I should add that, uh, yeah, these infill materials are using to make the walls more stable and uh, they are needed to be there to be more stable for the walls. Okay. Okay, I mean, uh, I, I just wanted to make a final, a final comment because I don't think I'll be with you uh, all together as today. Um, I mean, this group is different from the other groups because it, it only had 75% of the members. So we can only ask for 75% of the work. Um, and of course, this will have to be considered also later on. Uh, um, the fourth member is in uh, Myanmar and she was coming later this year, but we'll see how it goes with the current political situation now. In any case, um, um, well, I was extremely well impressed by all teams. The works were very diverse, which I think is a plus for all students because we hope you can learn from each other. I think the quality was extremely high and I was surprised on how much you did, not only uh, because the time is so short, but also because the conditions were not favorable. Uh, after January. And so congratulations, CC, congratulations. Um, I wish you all the best for starting the thesis, hopefully by Monday or Tuesday or the week after. And now you'll have a few more months of uh, very hard work, but by the end of July, you'll be officially on holidays. So all the best. I hope I can meet uh, most of you live in the near future. Okay, so best luck with continuation of your work and really, truly and sincere congratulations of the great work you did. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Well, thank you before much. concluding, I'm sorry, before concluding, I just have to say a few words about the, the group. It was really amazing work with you guys. So after 14 editions, there is still room for innovation. Okay, so I, I, got, I got very happy with that. And uh, well, uh, just a final word also to, to thank the contribution of Javier, uh, Rui, and Eduardo. They help us a lot. So uh, it was important to have that contribution. We, we, we needed this um, complementary expertise. And also we should thank the Regional Directorate of Culture for allowing us to use uh, this uh, monastery that will be hopefully in future a five stars hotel, this uh, southern west wing. So let's see if this works. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much, Roxanne.
Okay, so uh, to finalize, I um, okay, I, I um, um, thank you all for the work done and congratulate also for the work done. As uh, Professor Paulins was saying, we were uh, we had um, some limitations to assess the buildings in some uh, period, and uh, I think that. Uh, Almost nothing was reflected in the final uh, results of the of the work. So, uh, from my side, I would like to wish you a great work for the master thesis and all the best. Okay, for the next months. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, okay, uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Good luck for you all. <laughs>